Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, this morning. Welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you uh, today, all of you, at this lecture, and this uh, it's a lecture and a ceremony, in fact, uh, which is part of the celebrations for the 150th anniversary. As we've seen, uh, we're celebrating this year uh, 150 years from our foundation as uh, School of Economics and, and then as a university, uh, what, what is nowadays called uh, Comprehensive University. So an anniversary like, like, like this one uh, is, is typically a natural an occasion to celebrate the past and to uh, pay a tribute to the founding fathers and uh, all of those who have uh, contributed to uh, build the university and pave the way so far. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, so in addition to celebrating the past, uh, we've decided to uh, give these celebrations a special meaning and, uh, and to interpret them as an occasion to foster the future and to look forward to what we want to be as a university in, uh, in, in the modern times as a leading uh, institution of in research and higher education. And uh, so with that vision uh, in, in, uh, in mind, we have uh, launched a number of initiatives, and this one uh, is, is, is part of those. Uh, this is a, the last lecture of the Nobel uh, School series that we have hosted this year, and an initiative with which we have intended to bring to Kafoskari a series of outstanding uh, figures in science and, and culture, outstanding scholars and academics, uh, uh, have them be part of the community, not just uh, be here for one day, but uh, uh, involve them with our students, our professors, our colleagues, to sort of foster and, and sort of share their experience and, and you know, uh, bring their view uh, and their, in, you know, their, their, uh, their uh, big and, and, and long and, and huge uh, personality and, and, and contribute to, to the science and share all of that with our, within our own environment. And so by, by doing that, be source, a source of inspiration and motivation to all of us, and in particular, all of us as scientists and scholars and to the students. So this year, earlier this year, we have uh, hosted uh, Hols Shoinka, Nobel Prize in Literature in 1986, uh, Robert Engel, Nobel Prize in Economics Sciences in 2003, uh, Amartya Sen, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics in Economic Sciences in 1998, Mar Mario Vargas Llosa, Nobel Prize in Literature in 1910, uh, Robert Merton, a Nobel Prize in Economics in 1997, and uh, Muhammad Yunus, a Nobel, Prize in, Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. And today uh, we have our last uh, um, no, uh, Nobel Prize and uh, distinguished figure um, of, of the series, last but of course not least. So please join me in welcoming Professor Martin Karplus. He is uh, a recipient of a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2013, together with uh, Michael Levitt and Narie Warshall for their work in the development of multi-scale models for complex chemical systems. Professor Kalplus is uh, one of the most prominent figures in theoretical chemistry and biochemistry, and has long uh, focused his work on, the de on developing theoretical uh, methods for increasing our understanding of chemical and biological systems, and uh, his lecture today will somehow touch upon those, those uh, items. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaplus, for uh, having accepted our invitation and for having accepted to be part of our community. Today, with your lecture, we will also uh, honor you and uh, with, uh, with, our, with the award of our um, um, Price and be, uh, make you part of our community, making you an honorary fellow of, of Kafoskari. So welcome in, the, in, the, in, our, in our community, and please join me again to welcome him for, for being here. Uh, it's the third day of his stay in Kafoskari. He's been in, uh, with our students. He's given two lectures uh, in, the, in the past days, sharing, as I said, his experience with, uh, with our colleagues and students, and thank you for, for, for being uh, so available and, and sharing your, your time. 
There are two more remarks that I'd like to make before leaving the floor to the Laudatio by Professor Giacometti. First is that Professor Kalplus is a, an outstanding scholar and chemist, but he's also an outstanding uh, photographer. Uh, he's an acclaimed photographer who started his own career in the 50s, and uh, his images captain, uh, capturing lifestyles and societies in Europe, in Asia, and the Americas are shown in exhibits worldwide. And uh, by coming to Venice, he's also uh, uh, brought with him, with him an exhibition that will be opening uh, tonight and will be open uh, till November 30. It's the colors of the 50s and 60s. 60s. It's, uh, it's uh, hosted at the Spazio Ridotto uh, from today uh, at 5.30, the opening, till November 30. So please visit the exhibition. Uh, it's, it's just a, nice, a very nice piece of work, of, of uh, artistic work. And thanks for that as well. Uh, and then thanks to the, those who made this, uh, the, the school and, and this specific event possible. Fondazione Venezia, uh, one of the two main sponsors, together with the Bowers, was also uh, involved in the, in the exhibition and in the, in the hosting of, the, of our professors and, uh, in, and, and, uh, and in sponsoring the whole school. And thanks to all of those who have made uh, the events possible on our side. Thanks to Flavio Gregori, who's not here, is the provost for uh, um, artistic uh, uh, matters and, and, and cultural relations in Foscari. Thanks for, uh, to Marcos Garpi, provost for uh, promotion and communication in Foscari. And thanks to the staff in uh, Foscari, my secretary, the rectorate, and uh, Fondazione Foscari for uh, their work throughout. They, you have been splendid, and thanks for, for doing for doing it. And now it's time for, uh, for uh, Achille Giacometti, Professor Giacometti for the Laudatio, and I'd like to thank him as well for making this specific event possible. Thank you, Achille, and thanks to all. So, Rectus Magnificus, uh, co colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen and students, you know, I have to see the students today. So today we have gathered here to uh, honor Marty, Professor Marty Karplus. Uh, is, is, is one uh, Nobel laureate, of course, is one of the most influential scientists of the present time. Richard Feynman, uh, Nobel laureate in physics uh, and one of the legendary figures of the 20th century, wrote in his uh, celebrated lectures, uh, quote, Everything that living things can do can be understood in terms of the wigglings and the jigglings of atoms. Well, the work of Professor Kaplus made this visionary uh, prediction possible by bridging the gap between physics and biology through the unifying languages of chemistry. Professor Kaplus started his remarkable career with a PhD in chemistry at Caltech in 1954 a period that became later known to be the Golden Age. That was the time when the scientists on the opposite side of the ocean were competing to understand the secret of life. Uh, after the back-to-back -back discoveries of uh, the secondary structures in proteins by Linus Pauling in 1951, and of the double helix in DNA uh, by Watson and Crick's in 1953. His thesis advisor was indeed Linus Pauling, uh, the most fabulous uh, chemist of the 20th century, according to the definition given to him by Jim Watson. And Pauling referred to Mark Kaplus as his, his most brilliant student. Soon after the, he completed his PhD, he derived what is now known as the Kaplus equations, a fundamental tool in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, uh, and it was published, this was published in Journal of American Chemical, of Chemical American Society, and it became one of the most cited papers of, of, of this important journal. Uh, speaking of citation, I made a survey, and uh, uh, currently is the top cited, cited paper as night, almost 9,000 citations, a single one paper, which is remarkable, I think. This was the beginning of a golden rush that eventually led to the fundamental work uh, for which Professor Kapos was awarded, was recognized by the Nobel Committee in 2013, along with Michael Levitt and Henry Washington. 
The 60s and the 70s were a time of greatest excitement in the world of biochemistry. The first tranche of the three-dimensional structures uh, from X-ray crystallography became available, and Amphised has already performed the revolutionary experiments uh, showing that uh, the three-dimensional structure of the proteins was encoded in the one-dimensional structure of the sequence. That was, you know, he also got the Nobel Prize. It was a period when theoretical physicists and chemists were starting to develop, to develop numerical methodologies to understand the properties of method at the microscopic level. Those tools were at the infancy of uh, those days, uh, and no one dared to tackle any biological system. No one but Martin, but Martin Karplus. The difficulty of the problem was twofold. First, firstly, the, 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 the complexity of interaction was, was really daunting. But most importantly, uh, the molecular biologists hardly trusted this, this result. And this was the main problem. Uh, and then uh, Martin Campus came along and things rapidly changed. From that point on, uh, numerical simulations and molecular dynamics in particular became a fundamental and trustable to tool that could com complement uh, experiments and even predict the result from the outset. There was a time before and a time after Martin Kaplus. It was mostly because him that the expression of experiment in silico was coined to complement the most used uh, commonly used express, uh, expression experiment in vivo and experiment in, vi in vitro. The list of awards and honors is, uh, you know, is lenders, so too long to be mentioned here. However, there is, special, there is one which diverse, uh, deserves a special mention. Between uh, 1955 and 2013, the year he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Professor Kaplus mentored more than 240 students and postdocs that now are established professors you know, all over the world. Uh, this, this list of Carpusians, uh, which is now known as, uh, uh, as it now knows uh, uh, to be, is likely to be his most endurance, uh, endurant uh, legacy. Let me conclude this very brief presentation of Professor Kalpus' achievement by emphasizing his breadth of interest in fields other than sciences. He, this was already mentioned by the, the, the Magnifico, Director Magnificus. He was clearly a born scientist. He wrote his first scientific paper at the age of 17, discussing how birds were influenced by the magnetic field of the earth. However, from an early age, he has been fostering interest in art. We have an example of this in the exhibitions that he, you know, he will, uh, will be opening this afternoon. He will display his work as a photographer that started in the early, you know, the early 50s. Venice is, of course, uh, the ideal place to combine science and art. Professor Carpus himself hinted at this in his Nobel lecture when he was discussing the optimal way of presenting a film of two molecular trajectory trajectories. He realized that perspective was a crucial issue, as shown by Canaletto more than 400 years ago. He also realized that there was a regularity in the way Canaletto was using perspective in his painting that could be cast into a mathematical law. I've been looking to Canaletto painting differently ever since with different eyes, but I must confess I still have not understood you know, what he meant with that. So, Thank you, Professor Kapus, for being here, and thank you for all the things that you have taught to us. The, yes, the, the, uh, yes, so now we have the award of the Honorary Fellowship, and then I'm going to read the official uh, motivation. Uh, so the fellowship is awarded in recognition of Professor Kalpul's fundamental contribution to the study of theoretical chemistry, which has allowed us to improve our understanding of molecular biology and on the microscopic level, bridging different disciplines and promoting interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research, one, and of course in recognition of his Nobel Prize in chemistry awarded to him in, 19, in 2013. <laughs> Professor Kalpul.
It's a great honor for me to have this opportunity to participate in this celebration of the 150th anniversary of Cascosforo here in Venice. It's been a wonderful stay in Venice so far, though I've been working very hard, giving lectures, and this is the final lecture that I will giving today, and I'm glad to see that there are a lot of students here. I don't know in what areas you're in, but this is uh, hopefully will give you some feeling of uh, the types of things that I'm interested in. And uh, you know, it was called Motion, the Hallmark of Life, and so I to go from marsupials to molecules. And I begin by showing you the opossum, which is the only North American marsupial mammal, that is marsupials are mammals like kangaroo that keep their young in a, in a pouch rather than having placenta as uh, most of you, or at least half of you may have in the future. And I, I show it because, it's, as you can see there, it's a very lively animal. And we will start talking about the opossum and then finally end up with ATP synthase, which is known to make the molecule which is essential for life. Now, why did I choose the opossum? Because in addition to being as you see here, sort of lively. It's about the size of a big cat, and it occurs actually in New England, where I live. It also has what is called playing possum, and basically what it can do, as you can see here, it has an involuntary reflex in which it sort of falls down and looks as if it's dead. And the survival value of this is that many predators, like some of the big hawks or foxes that try to go after it, like to kill the animal before they eat it. And if it's already looked look dead, they're less interested in it. And the idea is that they are more likely to leave it alone. After a certain time, it wakes up and behaves perfectly normally. Now, it turns out that this reflex, it's involuntary, is actually very general. First of all, it has a name. Everything is given a name. It's called tonic immobility, even when people didn't know anything about it. And it occurs all the way from insects to mammals, to human beings, in fact. And it was first described, as it says there, in 1646 by a Jesuit priest who noticed that chickens sometimes fell down and looked as if they were, were dead and had the same sort of comatose reflex. And he reasoned that, well, you know, that when they had fallen down, they were communicating with God, they had made their peace with God, and so it didn't help them very much because he thought, ah, oh, they're ready to be killed and eaten. Now, it was realized later on, I could mention the hognosed snake, which is, again, a common snake in New England, and you see on the top, it looks like a nice normal snake slithering around. And on the bottom, again, it has the same fear reflex where it looks as if 
who are dead. And it's now realized that this reflex comes from the hypothalamus and certain neurotransmitters. And actually this gives me the opportunity to talk about my grandfather on my father's side, Johann Paul Karplus, who was a professor of neurology at the University of Vienna and actually was the one who discovered the function of the hypothalamus. What he did was the hypothalamus in the brain. Normally you think that everything from the brain is influenced by neurons which communicate with each other. But what he did was to take a cat, an anesthetized cat, and he cut away all of the neurons from the hypothalamus to, to the rest of the brain, and he discovered that it still worked, and so he reasoned that there must be some sort of a fluid which actually uh, transmitted the information. It's now known that this is one of the few areas of the brain that actually has endocrine gl glands, which, which produce hormones in the rest of the body, as you know, and it in these hormones which transmit the information from the brain to the rest of the system. Now, as has already been mentioned, there's a famous quote from Richard Feynman, everything that living things do can be understood in terms of the jiggling and wiggling of atoms. But I would also like to mention a statement that a very good friend of mine, Claude Payard, with whom I worked on hemoglobin, wrote, the x-ray structures of proteins are like trees in winter, beautiful in their stark outline, but lifeless in appearance. Molecular dynamics gives life to these structures by clothing the branches with leaves that flutter in the thermal winds. I mean, it's a beautiful expression, and of course it also has a science in it. The thermal winds are the, the kinetic energy that all uh, particles have, kT per degree of freedom, half kT per degree of freedom at the temperature T. So let me now continue this little journey that we're making here and go to myoglobin. Now myoglobin is the protein which stores oxygen, which is necessary for muscles to work. It's called myoglobin because it is mainly found in, in muscles. It's also found elsewhere nowadays and has other functions in storing the oxygen in the muscles. And uh, it's, uh, myoglobin is what gives the color to raw meat. When you cook the meat, you denature the myoglobin and it gets this color change to brown. Now, diving mammals obviously need the oxygen to make the ATP, that's the energy currency of the cell, and so whales and other diving animals have a large amount of myoglobin stored in their muscles. And if this works, yeah, this is just the molecular dynamics picture of the myoglobin, but you can see that it's made up of a Of a, of a bunch of helices, two of which clasp what's called the prosthetic group in between them, and that at the center has an iron atom, and it's the iron atom that can bind the oxygen. Now, one of the problems that nature faces, and it faces it in enzymes, in a, it faces it in a simple way in myoglobin. Basically, it's the question how, you know, you bind oxygen to the heme group of the myoglobin. How can you prevent the oxygen from coming out on the one hand when you need it or going in when you're 
charging the myoglobin molecule in the lungs. And you see on the right hand side, see, over here is a picture. This is the heme group here, and this is the, uh, the heme group in outline with the four porphyrins. At the center is where the iron atom is. And what you can see is this, this is an X-ray structure. It's actually the first X-ray structure of a protein that was determined by John Kendrow in 1958. It was after the war when the British were still eating a lot of whale meat. So there was a lot of whale meat around and he got the uh, myoglobin from the whales. And in this structure, you see this dotted region, which basically indicates an empty space where the oxygen would bind. And then you see this stippled region and the outside, and there's no connection between the two. And one of the first applications that we did of uh, very simple molecular dynamics was to try to understand how the structure can change so that the oxygen can come in in the lungs and then go out in the tissues. And we noticed that there was this residue, it's a histidine in sort of purple color, and uh, that actually a very slight rotation around these dihedral angles uh, could change the structure such that there was no connection between the inside and outside to the structure where there was a connection and the oxygen could get in it or out. And this work by David Case was done with a very simplified model. We now know that it's not only this one histidine that rotates, but it's the whole protein together, the dynamics stimulated by certain stimuli that permits the opening and closing of uh, this region. And this is sort of a very simple example of a general problem, which I mentioned in one of my earlier lectures, I think, or also was in a noble lecture, which is basically that um, an enzyme to be functional wants to be off, be isolated from the solvent because the solvent in many cases can give a side reaction, which you don't want to have happen. So somehow nature has designed proteins so that they can have the active site open for the substrates to come in, then it closes the active site, and then after the reaction has taken place, the, it opens up again and the products come out. And this is sort of a very simple example of this. Well, let's now go on in our journey and in particular, you know, I mentioned that uh, diving mammals like whales and also like dolphins have this problem of storing enough oxygen to make the ATP. And in fact, it was realized that people had done studies of the, how much oxygen uh, was in dolphin uh, in their muscles and they knew that they could only store enough oxygen, which was 20% less than what was required for them to be able to dive down to 350 meters as they were able to do. But then somebody in 2000 made photographs of the dolphins di diving and he noticed that what they did you can see the dolphin illustrated there, and you can see the tail fin of the dolphin, and basically the dolphin d d dive by sort of flipping their tail fins. And what he noticed in these underwater photographs was in fact that the dolphins don't keep on flipping all the time, but they flip and then they glide, and then they flip, and then they glide again. And by stopping intermittently, they're able to save about 30% of the energy, which makes up for the 20% that 
which they need. Well, let me now, this gives me an excuse, if you like, to show a film of the dolphins. Um, can you make it a little louder? them how they are flipping with their tails. Now this gives me also an excuse to show another film, not one that I did, but which is about spinning dolphins, which are really amazing to watch. And watch now, they come out, they spin, And they will do this over and over again. Nobody knows exactly what they are doing, or why they are doing what they are doing. But uh, I mean, some people think that you know dolphins are supposed to have a sense of humor. They're supposed to be very intelligent. And that may be one reason that they're doing for the fun of it. The other possibility is that they're doing it in order to, you know, show off in front of a possible mate, show who's the best spinner. It's not understood at the moment. So now let's go on our route to the microscopic from the macroscopic to look at, this is ATP, which I've talked about before. And without going into detail, the important part is this phos triphosphate bond where the energy is stored, which is used in, in the muscles. And now, when ATB is hydrolyzed, as you can see here, this is a French slide because I gave the lecture first in France. Um, it goes from ATP, adenosine triphosphate, to adenosine diphosphate and the phosphate by binding a water molecule. Now this liberates about 7.3 kilocalories and if it just happened, uh, without being coupled to anything, it would just heat up the water by uh, a few degrees. And so the way that the ATP is used is by in many different ways, but one way is to couple it, couple it to other reactions. And I show some reactions here, which if the ATP weren't involved, would have their equilibrium way over here, but by having the ATP involved and going to ADP, the reaction is driven over to the right hand side, and that's used for the synthesis of many, many of like amino acids, fatty acids, and such in living systems. Now, it's sort of this shows again the ATP plus water going to ADP plus PI. And what's interesting is that, you know, people like us who sit around use about 40 kilograms of ATP per day. Now we don't have that stored in us, so basically we have to con be continuously making it. And we only store about 250 grams, which lasts about 10 minutes just doing the arithmetic. So ATP is con continuously being resynthesized from the ADP and PI, 
and each ATP molecule that we have in the body is used about 500 times per day. So this mechanism of resynthesis obviously is an essential part of being able to live. Now where does this happen? Well, there are mit mitochondria, which are called the power plants of the cell. On the left at the top is shown a real micrograph. They're about the size of bacteria. Underneath it is shown a schematic, which shows that there are these little in convol convolutions, indentations inside one of these mitochondria. And if, if you make a micrograph that's uh, enlarged, much larger than this one, then you can see, it's a little hard to see with, with, the, with the fact that there's so much light here, but if you can, there are all these little ATP synthase molecules here, they're drawn schematically, but you can actually see them here. And without going into details, the overall reaction, you see that here is the oxygen and ADP is used to make the ATP. It's a, rather, it's a complex series of reaction, like glycolytic cycle, and it's one of the essential cycles which is part of being able to stay alive. And again, to get some sort of an idea, you know, there are several, a, hundred, a thousand to two thousand mitochondria between in, in each cell. There are 15,000 ATP synthase molecules in each of the mitochondria. So every cell contains 300 million ATP synthases. So it's really, the body is obviously one of the important parts is making the ATP that takes a lot of energy. And here is a picture again, which we saw before of the ATP synthase, which is a rotary motor. Basically it's driven by the gradient, the proton gradient from inside the cell wall. This drives the central part here, rotates it, and as it rotates it, it picks up ATP and PI, and the ATP, which is useful, comes out. Now, this motor can always also work in reverse. Basically, if you get rid of all of this and you feed it ATP, then it will cause this central shaft to rotate, and that's what's been studied in more detail, and I'll talk about a little bit more. Now, one thing that was discovered only very recently in 2014, if we go back, we can figure out how many of each of these subunits, as they're called, the three alpha subunits, three beta subunits, one gamma subunit, which is the central shaft, and these various other parts of it, there are 10 here in the F0 part. And so Weissman discovered in 2014 where he could actually determine how many of each type of protein was synthesized in the ribosome. And essentially what he found, again, it's sort of hard to see. If I can't see it, you probably can't really see it either. But it shows down below, you know, that the composition of the ATP synthase. And here it shows that the synthetic mechanism is set up so, such that it makes exactly the number of... Uh, the ratio of the number of molecules that are required to make up a full ATP synthase. It makes 10 for the, here, for
For the bottom part, there are 10 of these, and then there are three alpha subunits and three beta subunits and so on. So it makes the ATP synthase subunits in exactly the right proportion that is needed to make the whole molecule. This is useful for two reasons. One, that it saves energy if you don't make extra ones. And the other is that if, if you did make extra ones, you would have them floating around. And since they're set up so that they will combine with each other, they, they would form these complexes, which would uh, inhibit the whole machinery. Well, let me now look at, as I mentioned, if you just take the top part, this part here, and put in ATP, it will serve as a motor to, to rotate the inner part. And this was first shown by a Japanese group, which basically we have this now upside down here, held steady, and then at, on the ep epsilon subunit, there's a big molecule, an actin filament, which has nothing to do with the system. It's just a way of being able to visualize it under the microscope. And if we look here, you can actually see this actin filament rotating. And when I first saw this in the 1990s, when it was first published, I said, you know, this is really something amazing. And if molecular dynamics is good for anything, it should be good for trying to understand how this works. Now, it actually turns out here it's rotating rather slowly, but in fact, under ideal conditions, and when you don't use a big actin filament, but just a gold bead which reflects the light, and you can watch the rotation, it rotates about a thousand times a second. And so since that time, we've been working on trying to understand how ATP functions. And we've made some progress, and I want to show you just a little bit of the sort of insight we have obtained and I'll just go th through this. Remember I said that if you give the top part ATP, it will work like a motor and rotate the gamma subunit, and you see that's actually what's happening here. I just show two of the alpha subunits, which are important in the rotation, one in yellow and one in gold, and the rotational path, the gamma subunit, is shown with a little van der Waals spheres. And you can see that there is a coupling in which the alpha subunits change their conformation, which causes the gamma subunit to move. And if we look carefully, and it goes in steps of 120 degrees. And so now wh what will happen is uh, one subunit sort of opens up, there's opening up, and the other closes in, and this ends up in being a rotation. And we, it, it's this coupled motion of the alpha subunit, which open and close. And you can ask the question, how does this opening and closing actually lead to a rotation? And the answer is, which you, you can sort of see here. Here we're looking now down on the molecule, and you see that the the yellow subunit pushes off center on the gamma subunit. And if you have the gamma subunit held here and you're pushing it off center, it will rotate like this. And that's actually what happens here. And there's also a motor 
which was uh, designed a rotatory motor which works very much in the same way as the ATPase. Not that the people who made the motor knew anything about this, but the mechanism is exactly the same and it's now actually used in the Arctic and such to run various engines because it's not very sensitive to temperature. Well, this is just the credit for various people, both people who actually helped me to make the lecture and also people where I found like there's an opossum society, you know, you wouldn't believe, but there is one that has all these pictures about <laughs> opossums and so on. And in ending, let me, it's already been brought up, but I want to make more publicity for my exhibition, which is taking place at the Spazio Ridotto. As it says, it's from October 24th to November 30th, and this afternoon at 5.30 is the opening, and you are all invited to it. And I thought I would show, if I don't have any pictures in the exhibition, which are from Venice, but I thought if I should show a few pictures, Venice and other parts of Italy that are not in the exhibition. This is all very familiar to you. This was taken in about 1952. There's, I don't know whether these boats still exist with these very colorful sails. I looked for them here, but I didn't see any. It's in Georgia, it's down below, yeah, is, is where they use them. And this is Rome showing the Ponte Vecchio in the distance in the early morning when everybody is still asleep. This is the Colosseum. And finally, it's just the picture that I like very much. This is actually taken from where we lived in Strasbourg. There's a little river there where the swans nest. And this is the baby swan nestling on the mother. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>